Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sean Majuli, and I am just thrilled to be here with all of you talking about my favorite thing in sports, college football. It has been a tough season. Last year, we saw the strangest college football season I have ever seen in my young life, and I'm sure that anybody has ever seen in theirs. We got through it. We saw a national championship. Some teams had a shortened season, but the NCAA got it done. We saw a championship between Bama and Ohio State. Bama prevailed. We have out of that probably one of the best quarterback classes we'll ever see. We're going to talk about them later. We're going to talk about the college football playoff teams. Now we're going to talk about the teams that are on the outside looking in. And for all you young fellow sports fans out there, we might just see another NCAA football video game coming out soon. So we're going to have to at least talk about that a little bit. Everyone's too excited. The last one was an absolute masterpiece. So we got a great show ahead of us. I'm super excited. Make sure if you hear anything you like, or more importantly, anything you dislike, You get at us on Twitter, you let us know how you're feeling, we're excited to get out there, interact with you guys, and keep this going. So let's get started. Alabama had their first spring football game today, after winning a national championship after one of the best seasons in their entire history, going 13-0 and dominating Ohio State in the championship and it felt like a real game watching it on TV. It was just a scrimmage between crimson and white for Bama. But we had a whopping 47,000 fans in attendance, the largest U.S. sports crowd since the start of the COVID pandemic. Felt very nice to be watching that on TV. I can't imagine what it was like to be there in person. And to no one's surprise, Bama looks strong. They seem to have found a replacement for Mac Jones in Bryce Young, the sophomore quarterback. Earlier in spring camp, we were hearing him described as a right-handed Tua. They're coming back with a huge wide receiving core, and it showed in the game. Young was 16 for 30 for 251 yards and a touchdown for the white squad. The first one of those scores came on a great pass Stepped right into it, clean pocket, found his tight end, Cameron Latou, for 59 yards. That's clearly going to be their scoring connection for the year. Going to be so exciting to watch. Their O-line was a huge concern for the rest of the game, however. Clean pocket on that pass for the rest of the game was a struggle. Under a Bill O'Brien offense, their new offensive coordinator, that's not too surprising. He has stepped down out of the pros to come help Nick Saban run it back, win another national championship. Although, Sunday afternoon, Nick Saban was able to reinstate his faith in him. He said that he is the offensive coordinator, and he thinks that they will be able to have deep success with him. He also commented on Bryce Young. I think he did a good job today, Saban said. Probably in a game like today, 
There's a lot more drop back passes, just the way you plan the game. It wasn't a full contact game. That's not surprising. You have minimal number of plays you're going in to run the game. It's a spring football game, inter-squad scrimmage. But I'm starving for college football, as I'm sure all of you are. So this will certainly do. He also said probably some of the issues we're going to have is with the offensive line is guys missing. We got a couple of guys injured going into the game. A lot of guys just trying to get healthy. The pocket's going to collapse on him. It's the Bama defense playing the Bama offense. It's going to be a great game no matter what. However, he said he thinks Young did a great job all spring. We're going to continue to work with him. Saban said he wasn't the only one he impressed. He said that Young earned the respect of the other players in the offense during the scrimmage. That'll be huge going forward. But outside of the quarterback room... We got to look at some great running backs. We got Williams and Jace McClellan. He looked dominant. They are clearly, these two sophomores, going to make themselves huge parts of this tight offense. This game was played between the Crimson and the White squads for Alabama. On the Crimson side of things, Williams finished with 43 yards on 12 carries. He tallied four receptions to go with that. 65 yards, McClellan on the other side, 46 yards, 12 carries, but 7 receptions for 62 yards, nice grab out of the backfield for 35 yards on the first drive, huge for the Bama offense. Having a running back that can catch out of the backfield is an absolute staple for Nick Saban, and if they didn't have that going forward, it would be a huge concern, but no surprises there, Bama was able to fill every single gap for the players they're losing to the draft in a couple weeks here. Obviously, you can't just have a passing game with your running backs. Let's check in with those wide receivers. We had sophomore Treshawn Holden and freshman Eggie Hall having the biggest games. Holden having the biggest catches in the ride down there in Tuscaloosa recorded a game-high nine receptions for 89 yards working with that Crimson team. Meanwhile, Hall also showed his athleticism, clearly going to be the big play guy. If you follow SportsCenter on Instagram, you're going to make yourself familiar with this kid over the next year. Alabama is losing two first-rounders in Henry Ruggs and Jerry Judy. That's just what they do. They bring in the highest talent, they lose the highest talent, and guess what they do after that? They're going to bring in the highest talent to sub that in. Along with the absence of Smith and Waddle. They were out due to injury. No reason to try to get yourself injured in an inter-squad scrimmage. They sat out. They're trying to rehab. But despite being shorthanded, the tied offense tallied a combined 578 yards through the air between the two teams. At the end of the day, though, there is one gaping hole besides that offensive line that will likely be fixed once everyone gets healthy. It's this kid, Will Reichard. And I can see something bad happening now. If you're a team like Alabama, and you're constantly going to the championships, you need to have a solid kicker. This kid had a bad start to the day. And I could see if he doesn't get his kicking woes fixed, A, Bama's going to bring in somebody else, a transfer perhaps, perhaps just bring somebody else up on the special teams, or if they keep him there, perhaps lose a playoff game tragically should other teams become more competitive. Now let's get to those other teams. Let's start with the team that Bama defeated in the championship. Let's go to Ohio State. They also had a scrimmage. Theirs was the Brutus versus Buckeye game. Ryan Day was very happy with his team. He says, I think the future is bright here. He said on Big Ten Network following their spring game. My favorite player from the game was Jack Sawyer. You might as well call this kid Sack Sawyer. He took over on D. He's going to be the next Chase Young. I'm I'm calling it right now. He is nuts. He had four sacks on the day. He was a problem for a good Ohio State O-line. Six foot five, 248. Stand out from Pinkerton. No idea where that is, but he is going to be 
on the map forever. Next Chase Young, next Bosa, doesn't matter. He's going to be the reason why Ohio State's going to continue to dominate a ailing Big Ten. Some former players were there supporting their teammates, such as soon-to-be first-round pick Justin Fields out there supporting his alma mater. Hit the quarterback competition looking to replace him. We got C.J. Stroud, Jack Miller, and Kyle McCord. My takeaway from the day, it looks like C.J. Stroud's going to be the guy. He went 16 for 22, 185 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. He's working with the first team offense. Next up on the Brutus side of things, Jack Miller went 17 for 30, although on his first drive, he pulled an A2 Brute, threw a pick in the end zone to a strong-looking starting quarter, Ryan Watts. Is that good offense? Is that better defense in an inner scrimmage squad? You tell me. Personally, through the history of Ohio State, it really just begs that that was an exceptional offense from Jack Miller. We'll have to see if he can budge his way into that starting job in Ohio State. Like I said, I think that's going to be C.J. Stroud, but in the mix still is Kyle McCord. He's still fighting. I respect it. He looks to be doing well with his third string guys. He's got some chemistry. He finished 12 for 17, 184 yards, and two touchdowns, no picks as well. And on the wide receiving side of things, full, full, full of fun stories. Returning, we got Garrett Wilson. He's back. He's the strongest. He is clearly wide receiver number one. Next up's probably Chris O'Clave. This is going to be his last season. Hopefully, he gets to go to the league next year. But most fun, Marvin Harrison Jr. Wait a minute. Marvin Harrison? Not like Hall of Fame, Syracuse Orange Marvin Harrison. Yeah, that's his kid. And like father, like son, spectacular touchdown catch that made the limited capacity of Ohio State fans sound like Lumen Field in the playoffs. Head coach Ryan Day said after the game that he's still got a long way to go, but he seems like someone who cares a lot. That's always a good sign out of a freshman, especially someone who is born into it. Typically, you might see some issues where they might be lax, might seem entitled. This is not the case for Junior here. He might be the next big thing. Other alumni had something to say about this. Former Ohio State quarterback and former Washington quarterback Dwayne Haskins said that Garrett Wilson's reminds me so much of Bills wide receiver Stefan Diggs, who led the NFL in yards last year, so that's a heck of a compliment. And let's hear from one of my favorite coaches in college football, Ryan Day. He talked to Big Ten Network following the game. He says, I think our future is really bright here. You look at some of the young guys in the program here, they have a chance to make an impact this season. They still have a lot of work to do. But we made a lot of progress. We're behind in general. We didn't have a spring, didn't have a preseason, didn't have bowl practice. Missed half the season last year, as everyone knows. That was a big issue. Whether or not they deserve to go to the college football playoffs, having only played six games. I thought this spring was a really big deal for us, he said. But, again, we still have a long way to go. What an absolute... I say this every single day about Ryan Day, pun intended. He is a leader of men. I'm excited to see if he can keep Ohio State in playoff contention. Obviously, losing a quarterback like Justin Fields is a big deal, but it looks like they can plug one of these guys in and keep playing. Now, speaking of Ohio State... Now, speaking of replacing a starting quarterback... Ohio State and the team that got demolished by them in the Sugar Bowl. Let's go over to Clemson. Clemson's looking to rebuild. They are losing what has been touted as the greatest quarterback prospect to ever exist, Trevor Lawrence. And right now it looks like it's DJ Ujlelele's team. Yes, you're going to want to get out your pronunciation guides for this one. He had an impressive first drive on Saturday ended with a touchdown pass to Bo Collins. Great story there. His high school teammate, actually. They played together in Cali. But he held on to the ball too long at times. Dabo Sweeney talked 
later about wanting DJ to use his legs a little bit more and get stronger during the summer, and he'll have plenty of time. Although, tragedy struck later in the game, a bit deeper in the quarterback depth chart. Tyson Fomachan and Hunter Helms were the other two quarterbacks today. Fomachan started slow, played better in the second half, and then tragedy struck. Tore his Achilles on the final drive of a scrimmage game. Absolutely the last thing you would ever want to see. He finished with 163 yards, a passing touchdown, looking promising for later down the road. Let's all pray that he gets better. Helms saw some time for both teams, threw for a measly 88 yards, but a good completion percentage on 11-16, to although that's against the third string defense, and again, these are all scrimmage games, so... Take that with a grain or a mountain of salt. And then another position that Clemson has to replace. The running backs. Travis Etienne was amazing last year. And now, Lynn J. Dixon appears to have the first try at replacing him. He might be drafted later on. Clemson is a running back and quarterback factory. He rushed four times for 25 yards, but still... Dabo says he is the guy. They didn't rush very often. This was pretty much a quarterback showdown, as to be expected. This wasn't a full contact game. You don't want to have people running between the numbers in a low contact game. That's how you have people get hurt. Although, ironically, they did have a player get hurt anyway. Farther down the running back depth chart, we saw Kobe Pace and freshman Will Shipley and Phil Maffa. Pace shined early. He got 69 yards. Most of that on the opening drive. Again, pretty low contact stuff. Mafa, he scored a touchdown late. Finished with a measly 38. Shipley, only 13. Caught a pass, but he also got out there on special teams, so he's getting his reps. Dabo said later that Shipley and Mafa have a chance to be similar to the Thunder and Lightning duo that the Tigers had with James Davis and CJ Spiller years ago um they look decent but saying that they're going to be the next James Davis and CJ Spiller is pretty high praise and I didn't even hear comments like that about Travis Etienne I personally take that as Dabo Sweeney rebuilding his team after losing a lot to the draft trying to instill a lot of confidence because with Notre Dame now in the ACC that's a competitive conference with the top three teams at the top we'll say Miami Hurricanes always got a flurry going late so Dabo knows that he can't just cruise through the regular season like in years past Clemson's defense really really struggled last season we saw that most in their 28 to 49 finish in Ohio State in the Sugar Bowl that was a very disappointing end to Trevor Lawrence's career there at Clemson, but all in all, the ACC is still a two- or three-team conference, and speaking of the ACC, last bit of this segment here before we move on to our draft prospects, let's talk about our Notre Dame friends. Well, sadly for you Notre Dame Fighting Irish fans tuning in, the scrimmage has not happened yet. It's going to happen May 1st, and even worse, they're going to announce no fans Trying to keep everyone safe, an understandable decision. We're going to have to see the reaction to that as it comes out. Stay tuned for later episodes for how Notre Dame fans react to that. Brian Kelly is, of course, returning as head coach. His 73.5 winning percentage trails only, you guessed it, Nick Saban among active head coaches in the NCAA for football. He has at least, well, with at least 15 years of head coaching experience. They're losing Ian Book. Book is going to be a late, late, late round draft pick. He threw for 8,948 yards, 72 touchdowns, and completed over 63% of his passes while at Notre Dame. Ran for about 1,500 yards, 17 scores. Very, very good career. He's He'll be the first to tell you he's not the greatest in Notre Dame history. He said that publicly many times. He just hopes to get to a team. We'll see where he goes. More importantly, they got to fill that gap. Tyler Buckner 
is going to transfer in from California. He's a four-star dual quarterback threat. He might actually be able to help them. He's seen as the future for Notre Dame. A lot of people think he's a five-star talent. Some people disagree. We'll have to see as that pans out. We got another run. Ron Polis was the other quarterback in the 2021 recruiting class. He hasn't seen any college experience yet, but he's the son of a former uh, fighting Irish signal caller. So it's easy to view him as a legacy. Notre Dame is by far the biggest legacy school in the ACC. He had offers from other schools, but if you're a Notre Dame son and you get an offer from Notre Dame, you know what's happening. Another transfer that was announced, though, former Wisconsin quarterback Jack Cohn announced he was coming over to the Fighting Irish in January, right after they had their loss to Bama in the college football playoffs. We'll see how that battle turns out. We'll see if Notre Dame can hang in there. But now, let's go check out how those quarterbacks are doing and where they would fit best after this draft. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. to our next segment. The NFL draft is almost upon us, and by now you've read probably north of 200 mock drafts and are absolutely sick of them, and so am I. Every year we see quarterback needy teams take the cream of the crop quarterbacks, take them into their subpar teams. Some of them excel, but more often than not, we see amazing talent squandered at poor teams. Cough, cough. Joe Burrow on the Bengals, cough, cough. I want to take a different perspective on this. I want to ask a different question. I want to ask, which teams would these five top quarterback prospects that have been buzzing around everyone's ears excel at the most? Personally, I think that's a better question. And here's why. I want to tell you the story of a young quarterback named Terrell Pryor. He graduated out of the Ohio State University many years ago. He was drafted to the Raiders, played half of his games every year on a baseball field, and his talents were squandered. He was told, you're too skinny. You should probably transition to wide receiver. Yeah, you're mobile, but the accuracy might not be there, and I don't know if we can form an NFL offense around you. If that sounds familiar... It's because that's the exact profile of NFL MVP Lamar Jackson. And I'm asking the question lately, what if he was drafted to a triple run team like the Ravens? Would he have excelled more? And I think he would. So I want to ask, where would these five guys excel the most? And I want to start off with Mac Jones. Mac Jones, the Alabama quarterback who led them to a 13-0 season National championship, no fans and all. Great guy. Maybe not as great of a quarterback as everyone thinks because he had a better roster than the slime language two roster that Young Thug put together. But I think he would do best on the Washington football team. They got a team there that loves to run the ball. They need a high completion quarterback there. And Scott Turner's offense begs for a guy like Mac Jones who will only make the good decisions, doesn't need a crazy amount of arm strength, and he can just make the short completions and succeed there. 
Now, your first thought probably is, wait a minute, a quarterback can't succeed in Washington, that's unheard of. Let's not forget, this isn't the Washington team of old, this is the reigning NFC East champions right here. This is a playoff team, the 7-9 and nine playoff team, albeit, but a playoff team nonetheless. And I think a team like that would be perfect for Mac Jones, a team that's in contention, but won't rely on him to be the sole focus of the offense. And Scott Turner, not talked about enough, this guy's got the Midas touch, has worked with his fair share of subpar quarterbacks and made them more than exceptional. Let's go back to his Minnesota years, 2014-2016. He was set up with the less than spectacular Sam Bradford. He had a previous year single season completion percentage of 71.8. Six. The next year, Bradford notched the fourth highest passer rating in Vikings history with 99.3, a team that Brett Favre played for. Absolutely insane. And Mac Jones is going to need all of the love and attention in the world because he's coming from a world where he has Nick Saban, the best offensive coordinators, the best quarterback coaches in college football. A team like that is going to be perfect for him. He gets to hop right from one power O scheme to another, right from great offensive coordinator to another, and although Washington likely will not pick him, they seem to think they got their guy in Heineke, I think Mac Jones would benefit much more from going to Washington than where other teams and other mock drafts project him going. Moving right along, because despite what people in Alabama might think, there are other teams in college football. I'm going to move on to this absolute mystery of a player in Trey Lance out of North Dakota State. Polarizing player right here. Crazy stats in his one year as a starter. Let me just cue you in right here. We got a passer rating of 180.6. Decent. 2,700 yards, 28 touchdowns, and oh, by the way, no interceptions. Perfect on the year, and a great running quarterback. Where should he go, in my opinion? It's going to sound strange to say where a rushing quarterback should go and where he would thrive the most, but I think it's the Patriots. I think he would benefit so much from some Belichick love. Over the past year, we saw the Patriots become this weird rushing offense with Cam Newton. I don't think he's a long-term solution. I don't think anybody in New England does. I don't think Belichick does. I don't think their fans do. And for Trey Lance, coming out of North Dakota State, I think that's a perfect, perfect situation. He is likely the least complete of these five. And I think he's going to need all the love in the world. Belichick, as surprising as this might seem to say, He's a guy who will give his quarterback the love he needs, as non-loving as he seems. He's a guy that'll help you develop if you are not all the way there. Tom Brady wasn't that great a prospect coming out of college. He helped him excel. He's got a great offensive staff there, very similar to Tyler Roll's staff that he had at North Dakota State. They excelled in, sure, not a premier conference, but they dominated in what they had to do. And he showed out when he had to. Little questions about injury here and there, some questions about durability going down the line, but I think we've evolved past that in the league. He can always bulk up. I think he showed a lot of promise. His decision making was superb. Oh, and by the way, this kid can flat out fly. And as NBA father and internet meme LeVar Ball would say, never lost. Only had one year, but he never lost at North Dakota State. Not a great team. Never losing? Bill Belichick's Patriots? It's a match made in heaven. The fact that he could go to a team that's running a bend-don't-break defense like his North Dakota State team did, and he could just not make bad decisions, his only job, all he has to do, put up a few points a game in an NFL game, Pretty much all I think he's going to be capable of doing his first couple years. And he could still win games, possibly sneak into a wild card game with that team. 
I think that'd be huge for him, and I think that's pretty much the best that he could do his rookie year. Now, will he fall all the way there? No. Will Mac Jones fall all the way to Washington? Probably not. But again, I just want to focus on where they would excel the most, because year in and year out with the draft, we just see these guys get totaled, and it's it's just sad to see. But like I said, Joe Burrow in years, even Tim Couch might have been better, and going all the way back to Terrell Pryor 10 years ago, it's just, it's too sad to see these guys not live up to their potential. So I just want to at least live in a fantasy moment for the next few weeks before we see these insanely highly talented quarterback class here get drafted to the bottom of the league and go from the top of their conferences to just the worst teams. If Trey Lance could find his way to Bill Belichick's Patriots, we could see a huge jump in his career and he could go from a kid who is a mystery to possibly a future MVP. Maybe the next Lamar Jackson. The AFC East has become a rushing quarterback haven. We got Tua coming out of Bama. We got Josh coming out of Wisconsin. It's nutty over there. I think he would excel. And there's something I got to get off my chest about the Trey Lance discussions that's been going on. People have been throwing around the fact that he wasn't highly touted out of high school still, that he wasn't in a top conference haven't we moved past this by now? I think we've moved past this. I don't think you need to go to a top school to be a top quarterback. I personally think that coddles you. I personally think playing with only great players and then having to go to the NFL, especially in a top 10 pick, going up to a bottom team, it's going to make you bad. If you disagree with me, hey, reach out to us on Twitter. Please have a discussion with us. Join in. Be a part of the show. If you think I got something better to do than to respond to all of your tweets on Twitter and get into arguments with you guys for hours, you would be wrong. I'm here for it. And you know what else I'm here for? Our next quarterback prospect, Zach Wilson. What an exciting year at BYU. I don't know how many of you got the chance to watch him play, but he made an independent team like BYU look legit right off the bat. He and Kalani Sataki mushroomed their offense to a 13-1 record over the year. We're talking wins over Navy right off the bat. That was a 55-3 win over a solid team. Their Army game did get postponed, sadly, but wins over Boise State, dominant 51-17, no problem. Texas State, 52-14, no problem. Houston, 43-26, absolutely no problem. They earned themselves a bowl game appearance in the Boca Raton Bowl against another independent sleeping giant, UCF, and they dominated 49-23. to And in that game, he put up 425 yards, throws off the back foot, 60-yard throws. He was crazy. And he's been doing this for a minute. Wilson was the runner-up for... Utah's Mr. Football Award in 2017 after throwing for nearly 3,000 yards and 24 touchdowns at Corner Canyon High School. His father, Mike, played defensive tackle at Utah under the current Utes head coach, Kyle Whittingham. So what does Wilson do? He signs with Utes arch rival, BYU, and he started seven of nine games as a true freshman. Fast forward to four years. Personally, I think he's the best quarterback in the class. Again, come at me on Twitter. We're here for it. I think he's better than Trevor Lawrence. I think he's going to be. And where will he do the best? The 49ers. Kalani Sataki was a man who was not afraid to open up the playbook, not afraid to get tricky, and neither is Kyle Shanahan. He would be perfect out there in California. And not just because Zach Wilson is the perfect California-looking kid. Kid's gorgeous, I'm sorry, you just have to say it. Zach Wilson looks like someone playing Zach Wilson in a Disney movie about Zach Wilson. There's no way around it. And if teams weren't in love with him before the season, his pro day shocked people. Talking about 55-yard-plus throws off the back left foot, his hip rotation that he's added to his game in the past few years has been amazing. There's been a lot of talk about 
oh man, he's had two shoulder surgeries already. He's not going to be ready. He's not going to be durable. I think he's benefited. I think that's had him develop an NFL-ready throwing motion. And he's comfortable in a California-style offense because of what Kalani Sataki was able to put together in their 13-1 run last year. This would be a perfect fit for him, a perfect situation. He might actually fall to this one, so this one might actually end up being correct. And I think this would be a perfect situation for him. Niners are already moving on from Jimmy G, it's clear, but his seasons at Brigham Young were just crazy. No less than 12 wins at any point. Bowl games in three out of four years. Absolutely incredible. He ranked second in the FBS in completion percentage at 73.5, third in passing touchdowns against just three interceptions, and 10th in passing yards with 307.7 per game, some 3,692 total. He also rushed for 10 touchdowns. It's not a huge part of his game, but it's worth noting. He is one of eight children, all athletes. If he could go to a team like the 49ers, who have a family-style approach to football, a very close locker room, he would excel and thrive. And as a huge Zach Wilson fan, I personally would love nothing more. For our next quarterback, I got to introduce you to a good friend of mine who's going to be recurring on this show a lot, my word of the day calendar. Today, the word of the day was bemuse, to make confused, puzzle, or bewilder, and that's how I feel about Justin Fields overall. He only got to play four regular season games last year, six regular season games last year, and then winning against Clemson in the first round of the college football playoff losing to Alabama in the final, a pretty bad loss at 52-24. to We all saw that January 11th. That was the last real college football we've seen. We've all been starving since then. But where does Justin Fields go? I think, overall, he'd be best suited as a Panther. Panthers just traded for Sam Darnold. Maybe they found their solution there. You should tune in to the GSMC football podcast instead of our college football podcast here to see what our friends over there think about Sam Darnold and that situation. But for Justin Fields, I think that'd be a perfect marriage. He was the Mr. Football in Georgia. He's used to that weather, so it'd be natural for him to just go back to that kind of environment. He appeared in 12 games as a true freshman in Georgia behind Jake Fromm. He decided that was enough. He wanted to go to a place where he would be the man. He went to Ohio State in January of 2019, as Fromm was expected to be the starter again the next year. And for all intensive purposes, he lit it up. Although, this was behind, in my valuation, the best offensive line in the Big Ten, and in a Big Ten conference that simply is not as strong as it used to be. Pretty top-heavy. The sleeping giant that used to be Penn State finished last year ranked 18th in a coronavirus riddled season nonetheless but still none of their teams really excelled like we thought they would lest Ohio State they really did not show up like we thought they would against Bama but even with all this in mind I really like Ryan Day the head coach over there at Ohio State who had to take over for Urban Meyer after all of his troubles he's really similar to me to Panthers head coach Matt Rule out of Baylor. He helped turn around Baylor. All college football fans saw him turn a one-win team into a ranked team, move on from there to the NFL. I think that'd be the perfect situation for him. Ryan Day, leader of men. Matt Rule, leader of men. Historically, a high-octane offense that's ready to plug in a Justin Fields type. They had success with Cam Newton. They're not exactly perfect substitutes, but... Do you know who I think really is a perfect substitute that no one's really mentioned? Justin Fields really reminds me a lot of Joe Burrow. And when Joe Burrow won that national championship with LSU, he was working with offensive coordinator Joe Brady. And where is he now? You guessed it. Carolina Panthers. I think that'd be a perfect marriage for Justin Fields. I think that'd be the best situation. Again, Probably won't fall to there. That's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about where these illustrious, amazing quarterbacks would end up that would help put their careers the furthest. And now, 
in the words of the great office manager Michael Scott. We are at the bell of the ball, Trevor Lawrence, the lock for the first overall pick. So much so that Jags fans are buying him wedding gifts. Nutty. Absolutely crazy. I wouldn't buy someone with a million dollars wedding gifts, but it's a topic for another day, I'm sure. Personally, I think he'd be a great stealer. Lawrence stands at a towering 6'6", looking over pretty much every offensive line in the book, reminding me a lot of Big Ben in his early years, not so much his later years. He really would rely great on a coach like Mike Tomlin. His comments recently that everyone is saying quote-unquote inflammatory, that he quote-unquote doesn't have this chip on his shoulder, doesn't need to win at all costs, and his father's comments saying that he doesn't need to win a Super Bowl, I'm not sure what that's about. I don't know who that helps, but what would help Trevor Lawrence is getting some Mike Tomlin love. If you're going to have a big personality like that, if you're going to be saying things that get the media's attention all the time, you're going to want the Pittsburgh fan base behind you. They'll stick with you through thick and through thin. That's a team that loves to run the play action. Clemson ran the play action pass more than anyone else in the league last year, just as the Steelers did in the top five of the league last year. Tigers love to establish the run. Steelers love to establish the run. It would really just be a plug-and-play situation for Trevor Lawrence. Personally, I hope he leaves the Jaguars in free agency eventually because his Clemson career was amazing. How much fun was that? Might not have a chip on his shoulder, but he's leaving Clemson with two chips when it's all said and done. One of the Clemson goats, and that's where I think he should go. For all of my fellow college football fans watching these great quarterbacks over the past four years, for all of my fellow college football fans watching these great quarterbacks over the past few years, no, we're not going to see them go to great teams. Possibly we're going to see their careers wasted, but it is fun to think about where they would go that they would do best, and we can see them thrive. Sadly, this is not the case, and we'll have to see them on the Jag, Jets, and other garbage teams. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. earlier, last season's college football season was one of the strangest we've ever seen. We saw great starting quarterbacks miss random games due to having COVID-19 or possibly having COVID-19 due to contact tracing. We saw more than a few games canceled, mainly Ohio State only getting to play six games before the college football playoffs, and a lot of people thought that a lot of different teams should have been in the playoffs. But hopefully in the fall, everything will return to quote-unquote normal. Although, returning to normal sounds a lot like Michigan returning to their former state. But, that Alabama spring game's got to give you hope. A lot of people in attendance there, a lot of safety measures in place. Looks like we might be able to get it done. So a lot of these teams that were on the outside looking in might be able to play through a normal regular season schedule. And get back into the playoffs. 
Who are these teams on the outside looking in with the best chance? Well, obviously the first team we got to look at is the fifth ranked team in the country, the Texas A&M Aggies. They got the shortest end of the stick possible. Aggies finished with a 9-1 record, 8-1 in the SEC. Usually that's a great record. For them, it all went down in the end in the Orange Bowl, where they really got to take out some aggression, frustration, anger, whatever you want to call it. It was mean. 41-27 to over North Carolina. They were ranked number 13. I don't really think they have a chance of making it over the hurdle quite yet this year. Maybe in a few years, but we'll have to see. But... Texas A&M Aggies looking like they can make a comeback here. Head coach Jimbo Fisher, he's coming into his fourth year, might be able to return the Aggies to their elite status. Got a lot of other staff sticking around, OC, DC, kind of the benefit of not being a huge team. Alabama and Clemson tend to be a stopgap for a lot of hot up up and coming coaches. They tend to try to prove themselves as the offensive or defensive coordinators there and then move on to running their own team in the SEC or ACC. But having Fisher sticking around to call the plays brings a lot of stability to the program. But more importantly, I'm liking Daryl Dickey. He's back for his fourth year also. He's got a lot of great relationships with the players, got a great relationship with head coach Fisher. So although they might have a little bit of limited practices in the spring, it looks like that they're going to have a strong enough core group to come back and run it back. Maybe even get the respect they deserve. Some people really thought that they should have been in the playoffs in the first place. Texas A&M fans, they very much thought that. Two biggest misses that everyone's going to be talking about. Obviously, tackle Bobby Brown. He's going to the draft. Leading tackler Buddy Johnson, same for him. But... Rest of this defensive unit and offensive unit will be back. I really, really like their corners, Elijah Blade and Miles Jones. Their safety group with Keldrick Carper and Leon O'Neal Jr. They're sticking around. Fuller hasn't quite made his decision yet. We'll have to see what he does. He might transfer to a bigger school, bigger name, but I think Texas A&M is a fine school to get drafted out of. Look what's happening this year. Being in the SEC, of course, you got a tougher schedule, but that also means that the ranking team is going to look at you fondly. They're going to see your wins as more credible. So they could even stomach one or two losses in a normal season and still maybe squeak into the playoffs. We'll have to see. Personally, I like a head coach that calls plays. I think it brings a lot of stability to your offense, frees up your coordinators to simply help out each position make all the players better, and frankly, with Bama adding Bill O'Brien on the offensive coordinator side, maybe they can catch him slipping. We'll see. Next up, we got the Oklahoma Sooners. They're looking for their first playoff appearance since Baker Mayfield. They got their sixth consecutive Big 12 championship and won the Cotton Bowl in an absolute blowout over Florida. They got one of the best wide receiver groups in the country, some might say. Marvin Mims, Jason Hasselwood, Kennedy Brooks, all set to return. They absolutely spread out your defense. They undergrid this Sooner offense so well, and they're built up front. Yes, they did lose a few players to the draft, one to transfer, however... The players that they have gotten commitments from look strong. The in-state Sooners look amazing. The schedule for 2021 is not the toughest. That's huge. Probably the worst opponent that they're going to see in their conference is, I would say, Ohio State. They beat the Sooners last season before falling in the Big 12 championship game, so... Split the year. We'll have to see how this turns out next year. Personally, I think Oklahoma's a much stronger program. I think Ohio State just caught them slipping in a tough year. Every game before their game with Bama and then Ohio State seem like locks to me. Of course, any given Saturday in this case. If they could steal one of those between Bama and Ohio State, 
we could see them return to the playoffs even with a somewhat questionable quarterback in Spencer Rattler. Now, if you're not in the ACC or SEC, it's kind of tough to get into the college football playoffs. It's tough to get the respect that you deserve. But the defending champs of the AAC, Cincinnati, have a tough, tough schedule ahead. The defending champs under coach Luke Fickle have tons of players, got huge talent, literally huge talent on both sides of the ball, one of the biggest teams in the conference. They got road games against Indiana, Notre Dame, who are coming off playoff appearances, and UCF has been putting up so many undefeated or near-undefeated seasons that a win over them could look pretty decent. An undefeated season is definitely in play once again if they can beat the tough teams, but it's not going to be as easy as last year, but the difference is an undefeated season's actually going to mean something, but it's the AAC. So it's no losses or no playoffs. So those are your two options. But the Bearcats got a chance. They got they got to remedy their quarterback issues with De- Desmond Riddler's late game decision making. They kind of faltered late in their championship game. And experience on their coaching staff in that quarterback room might just be the solution there. So things could be looking up. Best thing they got is opportunity. That loss in the Peach Bowl is probably still going to sting though. That victory in the Peach Bowl might just be what carries the Georgia Bulldogs into a better season and into the playoffs next year. Georgia suffered losses last year to Bama and Florida, but they did so without their starting quarterback under center due to contact tracing, so I don't know how much credence you can give those losses. Of course, if you're the college football ranking committee, I totally understand. You can't give them a win or punch in a win for them in that case, just because they didn't have their starting quarterback. You can't just say, oh, if, coulda, shoulda, woulda. Tough year to rank things. Unbelievable that they even finished the season. I'm not here to disparage anyone. But I'm saying next year, they got a chance. And they're another SEC team. And ranking committee loves the SEC. They get a pass on playing Bama this year. That's huge. Starting QB JT Daniels is coming back. And put up a whopping 392 yards in that aforementioned Peach Bowl. Sadly, the toughest game of the season is the first game of the season. They gotta play Clemson. And they gotta play Clemson on the road in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this one's gonna be an absolute slugfest for Kirby Smart. I would not be surprised if if he lost this game and then had another loss on the season, that this is his last season as a Georgia Bulldog head coach. I know that's brutal, but that's the game. That's NCAA football, and in the SEC, that's what's expected. There's all of this talk last year, the year before, and the year before that. Can Kirby Smart win the big games? If he wins this one, that debate's squashed. It's over. It's immediately solved which would be huge for them and huge for the Bulldogs moving forward as a team. Commitments would be flying in. They'd be able to compete with Bama for years to come. If they lose, they might be able to sneak into the college football playoffs. They'd have to finish perfect. We'd have to see JT Daniels play out of his mind, running back James Cook absolutely ground and pound it for the rest of the year. We'd have to see this new-look offense be perfect for the Georgia Bulldogs and blow out teams. It couldn't just be victories. It would have to be blowouts the whole way down. But I'm, I'm rooting for him. I'm hopeful for Kirby Smart. I understand the position he's in. Trying to compete in the SEC with that recruitment battle with Bama is just so hard. Trying to get the better players. Yes, you're in Georgia. Yes, Georgia is a great high school football state. But still... If you're an absolute top cream of the crop quarterback, cream of the crop running back, cream of the crop defensive end, and you want to one day go pro, you're probably thinking Bama. As many Georgia Bulldogs have made it to the league, it's so hard to compete. And this would be a huge defining game. And you might just be booking them in to play Bama in that first round of the college football playoffs if they can come out and squash Clemson in that first game of the season. 
Now, speaking of tough first opponents of the season, let's go over to the Miami Hurricanes because they have the toughest first opponent of the season. Yeah, they're playing Bama right off the bat. Miami Hurricanes have been on the outside looking in for as long as I can remember now. They're a very solid ACC team trying to get back to where they were, and they very well could this year, or at least make a good step towards it, and they don't need to beat Bama right away to do that. Nobody thinks that Miami's going to come out and beat Bama first game of the year. If they did, it would be ingrained in Hurricane fans' minds forever. It would be likely the best moment of all of the players' and coaches' minds for the rest of their lives. Maybe they'd see a playoff spot after that, but even still, with Clemson and now Notre Dame in the ACC, it's still not even a lock. That's the hard part. Miami Hurricanes still have to at least knock one of those two off the mountaintop. Clemson looks a little bit doable, but they seem to have found an answer at quarterback. Notre Dame, maybe more so. We'll have to see. We'll have to see how Derek King can lead them in that game. He's been a great leader for this Hurricane offense. I like him a lot. I like him going forward. I maybe like him potentially being a draft pick as we all have the draft on our minds these next couple weeks. But right now, it doesn't look possible. Again, if they were to maybe beat Bama first week of the year, put that right up there with every comeback in the book because this kid is eight months removed from an ACL surgery, complete tear, and you would put this game right up there with D. Rose's 52-point game in the NBA. Whatever outlandish comparison you could think of right now, double it, double it again, then triple it, and then put it with rose-colored, or I guess for the Hurricanes, green and orange-colored glasses forever. Because it would be the highlight of the year for college football and the highlight of Derek King's entire football career so far. But... Even at the outside looking in, they could stomach this loss. They could keep their playoff hopes going. It would require a falter from either Clemson or Notre Dame. Continuity is very important in the college football playoffs. So for the Hurricanes, this year might just be a good step forward. Now, of all these teams we've gone over, who do I like the best stealing one of those playoff spots next year? I would have to say the Georgia Bulldogs. I would have to say that this is the year that Kirby Smart can get it done. I would say that this is the year that they can finally get to the top or near the top of the SEC, at least be able to compete in a playoff game down the road. It would likely be as a fourth seed, but still, that'd be huge for the program, that would be huge for Kirby Smart's career, and huge for the recruiting battle next year, so they can get back to it. After that, Sooners, most likely the Sooners, they got most recent playoff contention. Like I said, the ranking committee really does like continuity. They they got a little bit of a goldfish brain, and you can't blame them. It's college football. Teams aren't sticking around forever. Even staff aren't sticking around forever. So they're right to do that, in my opinion. If you disagree, as I've been saying, get at us on Twitter. Please let me know where I went wrong. Maybe I'll agree with you. Likely, we'll just be arguing on Twitter for hours as I'm supposed to be doing something else, but it's better use of my time and I'm sure a worse use of yours, but heck, that's what sports fans are all about, wasting time and having fun. And of course, I can see the other side to this. I can see the other side to, hey, we should have more variety of conferences getting their representatives, getting their conference champions represented in the playoffs I'm not sure how I feel about the full let's have every conference champion get in there and have them represent and have an eight team or ten team playoff because there are just some conferences that can't hang I mean no disrespect to the talented athletes of these conferences but a spade's a spade conference USA mid-american even mountain west with the great Boise State That's pretty much the only team from there that can hang. And the very competitive Pac-12 even. Like, it's a great year for USC if they break the top 10. Same goes for Colorado. Same goes for the Utes, Arizona, Washington, Stanford. 
like a lot of these teams can make the occasional great prospect, maybe two or three draft picks a year, late second rounders, third rounders and such. But for other conferences like Conference USA and Mid-American for those teams, they are not teams that are outside looking in. The, the five or six teams that we were talking about, those are the guys that are on the outside looking in. Other teams in those conferences over a period of literally, it's, it would take seven or ten years for anyone else to become competitive again. I'm just going to shoot straight with you guys, but if you put a Conference USA team like Old Dominion against Bama in the first round of the playoffs, a one seed versus an eight seed, that's a future accountant versus a future New England Patriot. That's going to be dangerous, like flat out. Not even that it wouldn't be a competitive game. That would be straight up dangerous for anyone trying to play Bama out of that conference. I could maybe at the furthest see this being expanded to six teams. I could get behind that. You get a little bit more competitive. You get a bye week for the teams that are the lock. It's more like a playoff than this ceremony of two bowl games and then one more on top of that. But even after that, you're. I feel like you would see a lot more kids sit out, especially seniors who are looking at drafts the next year. They might not want to play. You might not get the great entertainment that you want. When you have it in this structure that I know isn't the most popular, but when you really evaluate it, I think it's the, I don't want to say least of all evils here, but It's more like the most entertaining and safe outcome in a tricky, or let's go back to that word of the day calendar, bemusing situation. I'll put up a poll later today to see what all you fans think, whether you guys like the six-team playoff, the four-team playoff we have now, or maybe even some of you crazy guys out there want to see every conference champion get in there. But I'm going to tell you guys a, a personal story here. I'm a Pitt alumni. A few years ago, we actually snuck our way in to an ACC championship because of the way it was divided up. And Pat Narduzzi is not the greatest head coach in the world. Some might say bad. I might say bad. But if Clemson came into that game undefeated and we were able to somehow sneak a win over them and then we went to the college football playoffs at barely over 500 because we were able to win our division and our conference. I don't think that would be fair to the players at Clemson. I don't think that would make for great football in an entertainment perspective, and I don't think the fans would enjoy it. As much as it's an unpopular opinion, I like the ranking system. I think the committee does a fine job year in and year out. I think they did a decent job last year. Obviously, we're talking about the Aggies at the beginning of this segment, Maybe they deserve to be in more than Ohio State. Maybe it was a viewership decision to have Ohio State in there over the Aggies. I think it was just Ohio State has a better history and they thought it would be a more competitive game. They were right. Ohio State did end up going to compete for a chip. Those guys at least kind of know what they're talking about. And I think the system works. We can't always make it what we want. Well, except for the NCAA football game that we all miss. And as a college football fan that has been starving for college football, I've been tracing back to the college football games, and I'm excited for the next one. And I want to compare it to this new modded version that came out. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info.
one of my favorite parts of sports has always been the video games that come out every year. The Maddens, the 2Ks. I've even been known to FIFA here and there, although I am trash. But I try. And I don't know about all of you listening, but I'm sitting here recording this podcast for you at a whopping 150 and a lanky 59, and no one on this planet would ever describe me as athletic. But when I'm playing NCAA football, it's different. It's immersive, and I'm having a good time. 14-year-old me pretty much felt like he was Teddy Bridgewater. I think just about everybody remembers the EA Sports NCAA football games. In my opinion, the best sports video games ever made. Better than Madden, better than 2K, better than FIFA. We're not even talking about those. Honestly, they're not even worth anyone's time, in my opinion, but we'll push on anyways. Obviously, nostalgia's playing a huge factor for me. I'm a 22-year-old kid right now, and I grew up loving these games. Just abusing LaShawn McCoy to beat my friends with the University of Pittsburgh. I eventually went there, so it just has come full circle for me. I love the games. I think they're the most immersive. I think they're the most accurate, too. And they're just the most fun to play. They're the most accessible. These are players that you can relate to as either young gamers or even older gamers. There's something about college football that's more relatable than the pros. And that's what I attribute a lot of the success of the NCAA EA Sports football games over the years. However... We all remember that back in 2014, that was the last NCAA football game made. There have been a lot of reskins, a lot of re-rostering to those games, but no real updates that would say this compares to one of the new sports games in terms of graphics and playstyle. But on a fateful February 2nd this year, EA Sports tweeted something that has been eight years in the remaking. Quote, unquote, for those who never stop believing, college football is coming back. And no, they were not referring to the spring football games that were played across the country to make up for a tumultuous fall season that we were talking about. They were referring to bringing back these NCAA football games. If you're my age, it's a true hallmark of your childhood. If you're older, it's the reason your spouse, roommate, partner, next door neighbor asked you to please quiet down and shut that stupid game off for nearly a decade straight. Nonetheless, it's back and you're going to want to pocket away some money for a copy of the game and a few extra dollars for some earplugs for your loved ones. If you're like me, you've been starving for college football ever since the day that Bama crushed Ohio in the college football championship. And this was a huge ray of hope. NCAA 14, even though it was the last one, it was probably the best one of the series and possibly the best sports game ever made. It goes for over $100 on eBay. That's a crazy resale value. And this is a PS3, Xbox 360 game. It's an old game. So the fact that it's going for that much money means that it's not just my nostalgia alone. The economics is proving it. Everybody's nostalgic for this game and wants some more. And the idea of getting NCAA 21, the idea of getting to play as head coach Dabo Sweeney while piloting one of the best college quarterbacks we've ever seen in Trevor Lawrence, or running back Travis Etienne, doubling down linebackers, doubling down safeties, it's going to be awesome. We're eclipsing the hour mark of the premiere of our GSMC College Football Podcast here on GSMC Podcast Network. And if you hadn't caught on by now, I'm a bit of a geek. Some of my friends might say a lot of a geek. My mom and my sister might say a huge sports nerd who spends way too much on jerseys and sneakers. But you guys all relate. All I want is to be closer to the action. So the idea of hanging out with my buddies again, playing our favorite college football teams, 
piloting our favorite players, awesome to me. Absolutely awesome. They have been trying to find the release date for EA College Football 21, but we got no concrete announcements so far. It's to be expected the game's going to be out somewhere in 2022. Usually these games come out right before the start of the regular season in the real world. Obviously, with this being the first installation in eight years, a different situation. Maybe when these releases get more consistent, we'll get back on that schedule, but we'll have to wait and see. This task is a huge undertaking. It's no surprise that the fact that they got the rights settled in February or were just starting to, that they are still struggling to get all of the coding done, all of the graphics done, and everything else done on the next-gen consoles. The fact that this is going to take a while is no surprise to anyone. I would rather wait and have a complete game than have them rush it and have a poor game. We've all seen that before. I want to have the most immersive and accurate college football experience possible but if you can't wait luckily for us there is somehow bigger nerds out there than me there's a group called college football revamped they have turned the ncaa 14 game into a new experience they redesigned the uniforms they redesigned the field they dated the graphics, and added a college football playoff-like system. And it's just a mod on the NCAA 14. If you're not familiar with what that means, you just install something onto your game. You can look it up. Go find out. It's crazy that these guys did it all. Just a couple of guys committed to this, took them about a year, and they finished it. They updated the graphics. They added every team except Liberty. I could not find out why they couldn't get Liberty added or decided not to. They added the full roster and one detail that I have to appreciate more than the rest is they added Coastal Carolina's Blue Field. Not a huge deal, but I love that they paid attention to the small things. It's going to serve as an appetizer till we get that full game. That's a quote from Cole Winton, a 23-year-old computer science major at UCF and founder of College Football Revamped, and the reason I'm kind of reevaluating how much I do during the day. Quote, unquote, he says, That's why we started this whole project in the first place. That's why we've been pouring so many hours into it. We love this franchise and to see it be revived. It's just awesome. What true believers. I have recently gotten the chance to check out this project by these guys. It's incredible. Honestly, I think it's going to put a lot of pressure on EA to make an even better game. Possibly that's why the release date's going to be pushed to 22, because this game might just be a perfect substitute to keep leaning on those economic terms. Why wouldn't you just play this modded version with your old game rather than get this new one. It's a valid question, and EA's going to have to answer because this project includes updated school logos, uniforms, the fields I mentioned, stadiums for the SEC, the ACC, the Big 12, and Big 10 teams so far. But the rest of the FBS teams will be updated in their next series of modifications, which usually takes three to four weeks for them to develop and review. This is from Chad Walker, another one of the team's leaders here. Something that we've always said about the project is that it's built by the community for the community. I put so many hours into it, I don't even think about it at all. It's so much fun. A great group of guys. Both options are another great way to get reconnected to the action until we make it, until August, until September, when we get our full college football season back. But it's going to be competitive, and it's going to be hype. So far, only one team has said they will not be allowing their team, their players, anything from their squad 
to be included in the game. That's Notre Dame. That's their decision. There have not been any official statements made about whether or not the players will be getting residuals or any sort of payment from their game and from their likenesses in EA Sports NCAA football. I would have to assume this will be the case. That was the biggest issue after NCAA 14 was, hey, you're using my likeness, you're using my image, and you're making a profit. So if they're going to come back and make it again, I would have to assume that they're going to start paying the players. I would like to see it fair blanket residuals across the board, something that would make everyone happy and something that if everybody can sign off on, we can get the game going again. That's the only way I think this is going to get done. There have been a lot of arguments in college football already about whether or not a player could use their likeness to make money off of advertisements. NCAA's rules currently say no. But last year, last April, the governing body of the NCAA met to discuss whether or not they could use their individual, the players, their individual image likeness and names to make a profit while they're in school. It's a very touchy subject. The players obviously feel that they're entitled to it. Let's hear this quote from board chairperson Michael Drake. Allowing promotions and third-party endorsements is uncharted territory, he says. The news release also said that athletes will be allowed to appear in advertisements that reference their sport in school. They caved but they will not be able to use their school's logos or brandings in that advertisements. Seems fair, but what does this all mean? None of these specifics have been put into play yet, but the door is, by all intents and means, open for athletes to sign their endorsements deals with a bunch of third-party companies, and they are also able to monetize their social media channels, profit from writing a book, music album, hosting a sports camp, and start a business, among other potential opportunities. All of those sound good, except for possibly Trevor Lawrence dropping a mixtape. I don't think anybody needs that. But in all of those things, they're allowed to just mention they're a college athlete and the school they attend. But again, no logos and nothing that's directly proprietary of the school. Interesting. And I'm sure it will open the door for a wide variety of opportunities down the road. One of those opportunities is already upon us. UCF football has allowed their players to wear their social media handles for their spring game this season. Interesting, wacky, and fun, just like UCF. That's going to be interesting. I I assume that there's going to be rules about the cleanliness let's say of these social media handles but I'm feeling like an old man with this one because personally I'm not even sure I have an opinion on it I'm not even sure I understand it but if it makes the players happy I'm sure that's what UCF was going for you guys are gonna have to let us know reach out to us on Twitter and Facebook and everything and please inform me about the benefits of this I'm not sure I get it but I If the players are happy, UCF's going to be happy. And frankly, I don't see why I shouldn't be happy for them. It's interesting to see this debate of image and likeness and NCAA football games brought up for the first time in 10 years. It's a bit of a throwback, just like the game is. And especially with the modded version, that's going to bring out the same debate. But hopefully the community, the football community, and the people who love their football video games just come together and enjoy this one that's what I would like to see I would like to see somewhere down the road a GSMC football tournament get everyone out there on the sticks have some nice socially distanced NCAA EA football you guys can eliminate me in the first round I'll watch you guys play each other you guys can all make friends in our community here You guys can all make fun of me for talking about this game for 20 minutes and then being absolutely trash at it. I think it'll be an amazing time. 
everyone in our GSMC fan base can make friends and we'll move forward. We're going to have a great time with the rest of the show. I, I, I can feel it. This has been a, a, a nice premiere. The last little nostalgia trip I want you guys to take with me is back to the NCAA 14 game. I would pretty much exclusively use Teddy Bridgewater every chance I got. My friends would hate me for it, but I was pretty much a solo main with Teddy Bridgewater. It was too much fun. We all remember how great his college football career was at Louisville. Also, we remember the 99 overall rated Jadavian Clowney that he came by honestly at South Carolina. That was a lot of fun. Johnny Menzel at Texas A&M, it was just the best. I'm a Bridgewater guy through and through, like I keep saying. Reach out. This, I think, would be the most fun debate of the night. Get out there. Tell us how you feel about the best NCAA 14 football players. Who would you use to just frustrate your friends, pilot through the game while you're procrastinating work, homework, whatever it is you should have been doing while you're playing this awesome game, please tell us who you think it was. I I gotta say, looking back, there's pretty much just a few that there could be. There's Jadavian Clowney, who was the 99 overall out of South Carolina. There's Johnny Menzel, who had a 97 overall, which, tragic ending there, but for another day. Another great player, A.J. McCarron at Alabama. He got that 97 overall. Sammy Watkins at Clemson, pretty much unguardable. And it was just so accurate, too. That's that's what I miss about these games, is that the ratings were accurate. There weren't any trades that messed up your quote-unquote franchise mode or season mode. It was just pure football. And I think that's, at the end of the day... Even outside of the game, the video game, that's my favorite thing about college football. It's just pure football. It's just man on man, head to head, and for most of these young players, it's about pride at the end of the day. Should this actually come to fruition, we have a crazy year of college football ahead of us. We're going to be watching it, we're going to be playing it. We're going to be following the careers of our favorite players as they go to the pro leagues. Of course, you're going to be able to check out our GSMC football podcast for all of their careers. We're talking about our Trevor Lawrence, our Justin Fields, my boy Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, and of course, Bama's Mac Jones. They're going to have a steep task ahead of them wherever they go. It was fun to think about where they would excel the most, though. For those playoff teams, it looks like they have a strong spring ahead of them. A couple positions might need to be filled here and there for those top teams. And that just might open the window for those teams on the outside looking in. Those teams that were, some would say, robbed of a playoff appearance in this last year. They're going to have another chance to run it back as they always do. Most of those teams, luckily have most of their players returning, especially their starting quarterbacks. So that's going to be interesting to see which prevails, continuity or the bigger schools. We're going to be following those stories closely. Still to come, Notre Dame's spring game, their intra-squad match. That'll be interesting to see how they look to replace Ian Book. We'll keep you updated on that situation. We'll see if those Aggies can fight their way back into the playoffs Oklahoma, same. Cincinnati, hopefully. Georgia, maybe just making their statement this year. And the Miami Hurricanes in a tough ACC. That's going to be a very interesting story to follow and a very interesting conference. I'm excited for the year. I'm excited to argue with you guys on Twitter for you guys to tell me just how wrong I am. Maybe a few of you guys will actually think I'm right, but no matter what, I really want to thank all of you for being a part of the premiere I want to thank you all for being a part of the GSMC football podcast today. It's been an awesome premiere, and thank you for listening to the GSMC football podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That that really helps us. And also, 
if you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network, from football to basketball, baseball to MMA, and even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.